Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to AI for Good, all year, always online. I'm Charlotte Kant presenting AI for Good Perspectives. AI for Good is a year-round digital platform where AI innovators and problem owners learn, build, and connect to identify practical AI solutions to advance the UN SDGs. AI for Good Perspectives offer expert insights, global visions, and shared solutions from the AI for Good community. And today we are going to find out how to keep workers safe with machine vision. And I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Rash David, the CEO at Detect Technologies, which co-developed the T-Pulse safety monitoring technology that we are going to discuss today. Hello, Daniel. Hey, hi, Charlotte. Pleasure to be here. Also with us today is Perry Lopez, who's a safety subject matter expert at Shell and who helps sites use and deploy the tool to get the most of it. Hello there. Hey, glad to be here, Charlie. And also with us today is Amy Channon. Amy is general manager for artificial intelligence at Shell. Welcome, Amy. Hi, thanks for the invite. And thanks for joining us. Now, we are going to talk about an AI-driven machine vision system called T-Pulse implemented at Shell Industrial Sites and which can predict fall hazards, spot damaged insulation, and even remind workers to wear safety gloves. So first of all, Daniel, could you briefly present T-Pulse and tell us about the big problem it helps to solve on industrial sites? Absolutely. No, thank, thank you for that, Charlotte. So very, very simply put, I, I would say T-Pulse is, is currently one of the most uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence platforms in the world that has the ability from uh, data input of any visual device, whether it's fixed cameras, drones, or, or robots, or anything with visual data, uh, the AI system has the ability to identify safety risks of various forms and subsequently alert the required personnel at site both tactically for immediate intervention, as well as strategically, where you can use the data to change culture. So bottom line, T-Pulse is a tool that is strategically used to either prevent incidents from happening and additionally improve the overall safety culture of the facility. Thank you very much. Now, Perry, how does it feel to be protected by AI? Because I think that in the general, uh, public psyche at the moment, there are lots of concerns about AI, but you're using it to enhance safety. So tell us how it's changed your everyday work as a safety expert. Yeah, I would say from, from our standpoint and how we use it is it, it enables us to be in several locations at one at one time, um, being able to get alerts uh, of, of unsafe um, acts and conditions uh, really puts us uh, uh, and, and an advantage to be able to go out and and to engage with the with with the workers and with the folks in the field, so that we're able to 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 see about you know how do we <clears throat> how do we work smarter how to work safer in in the field. And Perry, I mentioned in my introduction some of the applications of the solution in, in safety, uh, but can you tell us a bit more maybe about the threats that it can detect? Yeah, one of the things, you know, uh, that we were looking for is to really reduce the amount of uh, line of fire incidents that, that we uh, that we encounter. And um, what uh, we learned from this technology is that we're able to detect those those line of fire injuries or, or potential injuries such as, you know, reversing, such as, uh, you know, struck by moving object, caught in between objects, dropped objects, uh, those types of things. Also looking for you know, unsafe condition, conditions around you know, confined space injury, uh, working at heights. Um, you know, there's several things that this that this AI can can predict or, or can look at, and and able to uh, to kind of give us a, a heads up as uh, those unsafe acts and conditions. So, Daniel, tell us how the technology works. <clears throat> how can it spot all those potential threats? Yeah, yeah. So, so largely, I would say, and and the thesis was, I think, over the last couple of decades, many industries have actually spent millions in equipping themselves with the latest instruments and gadgets 
um, whether it's sensors, visual devices, cameras, and, and, and the like, uh, both at the shop floor level from the smallest fabrication yards or terminals all the way to the largest construction sites and large refineries, right? Um, now, this has resulted in a massive amount of data that is generating like a wealth of, of, of information. And it's become tough to actually analyze all of the data and make sense of it. So effectively what Tpulse does is it's a centralized cloud-based AI platform that can plug in to those data input devices. A lot of what we've done with Shell is visual devices like cameras. It can utilize the, the feed that is coming in from these devices and it uses an AI brain or engine that has learned over close to more than, more than half a decade, over more than 12,000 to 13,000 devices and has understood what is OSHA and what is IOGP. So effectively, the AI now goes through all of that information and produces results and useful actions, right? Uh, implementable actions, both at the front line um, of what kind of recommendations uh, are there for the safety supervisor of, let's say, a specific unit within a very large refinery, all the way to statistics, right? That the site management or the corporate leadership also can look at and then see what is going to move the needle for the safety culture as a whole. I, I hope that answers your question, um, but I'm happy to elaborate as and when required. Very much so. Thank you very much, Daniel. Now, Amy, I'm wondering what the ethical and legal challenges of the solution are since employees are recorded and their behaviors are analyzed. How do you handle those considerations? Well, I think it's, firstly, it's important to remember that what we're doing is to enhance employee safety. That's the major reason we're doing it because we take it incredibly seriously. So, um, and the mechanism is through, as you say, um, monitoring and recording images via CCTV, but we do that anyway. These are dangerous sites where you do need to monitor for security and safety reasons what's going on. So you're not actually doing anything new when you implement T-Pulse in these environments. What you are doing differently, as you say, is you are looking at behavior in a slightly different way. But again, it's it's, it's all for the good. It's all to identify unsafe, um, unsafe situations and unsafe behaviors. Now that in itself can be problematic if you think if people can worry about it because they think you're looking for opportunities to find out something I've done wrong and then you'll let me go, for example. But that's not the approach we take. So firstly, you're already being recorded, but you also go through a very specific process whenever you put something like this in to sort of staff consultation to make sure that people fully understand what's going on and that, they've, and, and that they're brought into it. There's also face blurring that we use. So you cannot in identify individuals in this because the personal characteristics um, face is, is, is blurred like that. What you can see is what people are, are doing and where they're sitting, which is what you need in order to be able to look at this. Um, finally, in terms of you, you follow all the requirements um, and more in terms of the, uh, around what we would normally do for monitoring and um, this kind of work. So for example, with data deletion, we actually delete data much sooner than we're required to under normal circumstances. Because again, the purpose of this is to identify unsafe situations and behaviors, intervene in the moment when that's possible and when that makes sense, and otherwise look at it subsequently to identify hotspots and identify changes of cultures that need to happen. So people are very respectful of people's individual rights and identity, and it's more about how you identify, how you make the culture better. Well, it sounds like win-win really. Now, Perry, uh, in terms of the safety process, once a threat has been diagnosed or identified, what happens? Yeah, no, great question. Um, and what normally happens is whenever a, a safety observation is, occurs, you know, unsafe act or condition is out in the field, the AI actually notifies whoever we, we deem is, is uh, it could be a, a supervisor, it could be a um, uh, HSC manager, HSC advisor, or it could even be someone in the field. It could be an operator or maintenance or a craft individual. Uh, and, I, and in some areas, we, you know, we, or contractor, right? Depends on who we, we actually get uh, the notifications. They get notified. Um, and as Amy and as Daniel both alluded to, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is try to create this culture of, of care, right? Into the field. 
And so what we do is we actually go out and engage with the individual or the condition and, and try to correct the, the, the unsafe behavior or condition with them, but do it in a manner to where it's not threatening or punitive or any of that, really looking into that care model to, to be able to, to engage with the individuals, engage with the contractors or the, or the, the maintenance individual or the operator, whoever it is, um, and, and try to, to resolve the issue. Um, and we do it in quite near real time as, as possible. Um, and, and that happens within, uh, you know, as, as, as soon as that, that observation occurs, which then we get those positive results to that, right? Those, we've noticed that those conditions kind of uh, tend to dissipate over time, uh, such as, you know, housekeeping or, or if it's a repetitive incident that occurs, you know, we see those conditions kind of uh, go down uh, after time, so. Thank you, Perry. Amy, how much can you trust the AI? Do you trust it 100%? And what's your approach to decisions made by AI in such complicated and delicate matters as safety incidents? I think that's a bit like asking, do you trust humans 100%? Um, I, I wouldn't, but I mean, if you're asking humans sensible questions in an environment you understand on topics they're expert on, um, is trustworthy. But I think one of the key things here is you're not actually asking the AI to make a decision. What you're doing is enhancing the information and analysis you get from it so that humans can go and make the intervention, do the education, and really understand what's going on. And I'm not saying in some circumstances you do ask AI to make a decision. In safety, I think it's an area where what we call human in the loop, that is AI provides analysis, AI provides information, and a human takes that and goes and make an intervention or some kind of decision on it, that's a very common pattern that we see there. So I think just remember, you can use AI in a very stupid and counterproductive manner, but if you've implemented it, or if it's a good model, you've implemented it well, you have a sensible process around it, it, it should enhance what humans are capable of doing. Because don't forget, we have a baseline level of safety here. We take safety very, very seriously in Shell. And the question is always, how can we do better? And our trials with T-Pulse have shown that with does, it does make us do a lot better. And that's what we're looking for. So Daniel, tell us more about that. How can your solution improve and learn constantly, especially when it comes to safety generally? No, that's a great question, actually. But um, effectively, at its, at its simplest form, right, AI learns similar to like how a child learns except much, much faster, right? Um, by feeding an AI responsibly with data around a specific event, it is taught more about that event. And with sufficient data, it starts recognizing that event in, in patterns that keeps coming up. The same goes for all of your photo apps that you might have right now. Suddenly your phone start telling you, hey, here's a picture from your birthday or here's a set of mountains that you visited, right? It's the same thing, except very trained towards industrial circumstances, right? So effectively, it really boils down to the better the training of the data, the more accurate the results. And this is true for, for all, all kinds of applications and safety for that matter is actually no different, right? Fortunately, in the case of safety, you have global standards such as OSHA and IOGP, which lay the, the framework for safe practices in, in the industrial sector. And an AI model can take this as a basic skeleton and then be fed with sufficient data to compound that learning or that knowledge. So with the right data, careful training, very supervised uh, uh, training, it can start recognizing equipment, people, and the imminent risks and interactions between them where you can go beyond simple object detection to very complicated scenario detection as well. Uh, but that's effectively how, how the AI learns and, and operates. Thank you, Daniel. Perry, since the AI is capable of learning that quickly, when would it replace humans in the safety process? Or will it ever? <laughs> yeah, no, I I uh I think we're 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 several years from that ever happening. <laughs> um and what I mean by that is that uh, there's this component of of as I mentioned earlier, care, right? Um, I don't think the AI is, is able to, to detect the care pieces yet. And I think it does require what, what we have those engagements with people 
in the field, you know, that's, you know, when we kick off a lot of these projects and, and deployments, that's the first thing that, that's out of the gate is the care component, because that's the whole intent is that we care for people at Shell and we want people to go home the same way they came to work, right? Um, and so uh, that care component of engaging with people to ensure that they work safely um, and, and they correct those unsafe behaviors and conditions is, is critical. So while the AI provides the, the eyes for, for us to be in several locations at one point, uh, it doesn't provide the intervention or the engagement that we need in the field uh, to ensure that people are, are, are cared for. So, Thank you, Perry. And to wrap up this conversation, Amy, aside from machine vision, what are the other AI-driven opportunities for improving safety at Shell and beyond? Um, yeah, well, quite a few already that we work on. So um, as um, as Perry mentioned, you know, we've got a, quite an infrastructure of sensors, sort of 20,000 20, or so, which are monitoring equipment daily. And often this is for predictive maintenance, but actually it's also to, to track when these might be getting into dangerous situations. Dangerous to, um, so you can identify very early if things go wrong. And that just helps keep the estate um, uh, in a safer way. So then we also use natural language processing um, to, through very large volumes of data in operations reports or risk assessments or incident reports. So you can find patterns in high risk reporting and prioritize areas where you see risk happening, you see, see incidents or near misses happening a lot. And then you can, you can have a closer look at that. And we found that actually that's quite insightful. People often have a good sense of where they think incidents are happening, but it gives you this extra lens and can let you kind of then deep dive into it, say, do what's going wrong, do we need more interventions here? And that's quite interesting because often that kind of unstructured data is hard to analyze. And then in general, we'll use data analysis to look at where hotspots are, and you can use experiments combined with proper statistical analysis to where you can correct. So for instance, uh, I know in Australia, we looked at some where we're modifying shift patterns because we know that night work, for instance, is more dangerous, things happen. If you modify the shift patterns, are people happier? Does less happen? And then you reschedule work accordingly. And so you, for instance, you do non-urgent high risk work only during the day. You don't do it at night, for instance. And, and it's those kind of analyses. So you're, you're basically using all the data you have, whether it's quantitative data, language, or vision, to try and get that holistic view of what's going on and then use it to intervene. And it's interesting that actually what Perry was saying, you know, we, we can never replace the care component. I wonder whether, this is highly speculative, with things like uh, large language models being in such a great um, position, you know, it's thought to be really useful for education. You have, you would have a tutor that is unendingly patient with you. I wonder that that would be a great safety tutor for you if you needed a lot of help. Someone who could intervene on the spot talk you through things, be patient, have the right tone of voice. That's science fiction, but I, I think there's a lot, a lot further we can go with all this. Food for thought. Thank you very much, Amy, Daniel and Perry. Thank you for a fascinating conversation, discussion today. Stay tuned for more from AI for Good all year, always online. <laughs>